The game breakdown said that a fourth quarter melee between Juan Oldham and Bill Lane Beer woke up the fans at Chicago Stadium. Lane Beer lost his balance on a rebound attempt and grabbed Oldham by the face and jersey on his way down, only to have Juan twist his body and slam Lane Beer to the ground. Oldham said that Lambier had been taunting and pulling on his jersey as they ran up court. <laughs> That's unlike Bill. And had his right fist cocked as he stood over Lambier and was, and I quote, primed and ready to kill, <laughs> end quote. <laughs> That's a little over the top from Jawan. <laughs> Oldham, Jawanted for murder. <laughs> <laughs> I always like to say that Michael got to play with me for a year at North Carolina. <laughs> I think it really helped him. Spectacular player from the beginning. You can see right away Jordan was going to be a big-time scorer. And showed what an impact he was going to have on the league. This is NB85, celebrating the 30-year anniversary of Michael Jordan's rookie season in the NBA. And now, your hosts, Adam Ryan and Aaron Steen. Welcome back to another episode of NB85. Aaron, we're up to episode 24 of this series. I appreciate you being part of the show as always, mate. How are you again today? Good, mate. We've uh, just agreed with each other that this will be probably our best episode thus far. <laughs> Nothing like expectations. I think there's some great things that happen in this period of time. We're going to be covering the next 15-day block of the NBA's 39th season. NBA News, Notes and Quotes, March 10th through 24th. 1985. Do we have any follow-up? We did trivia once and then canned it. <laughs> no, we haven't done it since. <laughs> we haven't done it since. Maybe we should add something at some stage in a future episode, but no follow-up of note? No. If you're new to the show, welcome. And if you're one of our regular listeners, welcome back. Thanks again for being part of the show as well. Now, mate, let's get straight into the episode. On March the 10th, Dallas gave coach Dick Motter his 700th career victory. At the time, he became just the fourth coach in NBA history to achieve the milestone, joining Red Auerbach, Jack Ramsey, and Gene Hsu in the Dallas's 126-113 to win at New Jersey. A great milestone for Richard. <laughs> on March 10th, the Tribune had an article on 7'6 Bridgeport University freshman Manu Boll, who was visiting the Chicago Bulls locker room before the game that they played against the Boston Celtics in Hartford, Connecticut. Minute's team was due to play there against the University of Connecticut on the following night. It said in his first game in college, Minute had 20 points, 20 rebounds and six blocks and it detailed his ability to dunk on his tippy toes and touch each side of the backboard at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Some great little facts there to go alongside the great Minute Bowl. Now, mate, March 11th, Chicago took on the Washington Bullets at the Capitol Center in Maryland. The Bulls lost the game 119-112 to 112 in front of 11,262 fans. The Bulls dropped to 30-34 and 34 on the season. The Bullets were missing their starting center and former podcast guest Jeff Ruland in all com slash 45 with a strained shoulder. This game commenced a stretch of five games in seven days for the Bulls for Chicago. Quentin Daly had 24 points. Dave Corzine had a monster. 22 points, 8 rebounds, and 4 assists. And MJ had 21 points, 4 rebounds, and 4 assists. For Washington, they were led by Jeff Malone, who had 37 points on 16 of 24 from the field. Very good numbers. Gus Williams had 22 points and 12 assists. And Cliff Robinson, not that Cliff Robinson, had 20 points and 7 rebounds. Bob Sakamoto wrote that it was the Bulls' first game under new owner Jerry Reinsdorf, and they celebrated with one of their worst defensive efforts of the season. <laughs> their lack of a help defense led to 57% shooting by the Washington Bullets, led by Jeff Malone's 16 for 24, which is just extraordinary shooting in one game. Mm -hmm. The Bullets led 107 to 90 with 941 left in the fourth quarter, leading to Kevin Lockery throwing in the towel and playing his reserves at the rest of the game. This game was in the middle of a stretch of 13 games in 20 days, which may have led to the lack of effort on the defensive end on the part of the Bulls. Dave Corzine was the one ball that shot like a bullet, hitting his first 10 shots on his way to 22 points. I was going to say if any team was going to be able to shoot well, it would be the Bullets, but then you've actually trumped me by saying that Dave was on fire himself. So good work, mate. You're a gun. 
Now, Detroit played the LA Clippers on this same date and were 121 to 114 winners. The game was played at Cobo Hall. I might be pronouncing that incorrectly. I'm not even sure. It was in lieu of the Pontiac Silverdome, which had a roof collapse the week prior, which we did allude to in a previous episode of this series. This was the first Pistons game at Cobo Hall since April 9th of 1978. There was a small piece in the Chicago Tribune on the the roof collapse at the Silver Dome and the fact it was going to cost about $9 million to repair it. So it was a pretty serious incident, I think. I think for the most part, the Pistons played at Joe Lewis Arena, but this particular game was played at Cobo Hall. So another little fascinating tidbit. That's awesome. I never heard of Cobo Hall before. A little tidbit about the aforementioned Cobo Hall. It was opened in 1960, renovated in 1989 and 2012, and also expanded during the renovation in 2012. It's a convention center situated along Jefferson and Washington Avenues in downtown Detroit. Good little facts. And also the amount of times that the word fact and tidbit have been said in this podcast series would be astronomical. Interesting. (laughs) March 12th, Kevin McHale's nine-day-old record as Boston's all-time single-game high scorer at 56 points came to an abrupt end when Larry Bird dropped 60 on 22 of 36 shooting against the Atlanta Hawks in the Hawks' home-away-from-home game that was played in New Orleans. Boston won the contest 126 to 115. Time for some shameless self-promotion, I'm afraid. Episode 56 of In All Airness podcast, my guest is former NBA veteran Rick Brown, and we discussed this game because Rick was one of the many Hawks players who had the unenviable task of trying to clip birds' wings. Yet another one of your In All Airness episodes with a previous, to me at least, unknown NBA player that was an absolute ripper. Oh, I'm glad you enjoyed it, mate. I actually haven't had a chance to speak with you about that one yet, but prior to researching Rick's career, I had no idea, honestly, who he was either, except for when I found out in one of the recaps about Larry's 60-point game. Doc Rivers mentions Rick Brown pushing Bird out of bounds on a three-point shot that didn't count when Larry just hit a ridiculous 24-foot fadeaway. That's the first time I'd really actually heard of Rick's name. So yeah, good to hear, mate. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Is he the one who pushed Larry out of bounds when he hit that three when he landed on the laps of the bench players for the Hawks? Yeah, he landed, I think, in the lap of the trainer or someone like that. That was allegedly Rick. Rick Brown. Nice little piece of NBA history there in itself. Uh, Larry's 60 points equaled Bernard King's Christmas Day of 1984 output as the equal season highs for an individual player. On this same date, Detroit visited Chicago Stadium in front of 13,227 fans and the Bulls had a very stirring victory, 111-110. to They improved to 31-34 and on the season. This was the first home game under the ownership of Jerry Reinsdorf. Detroit were at full strength with the return of Kelly Chapuka. It was the first time in six weeks that the team had a full complement of players to choose from. For Chicago, Jordan went 32 points, 8 rebounds and 4 assists on the Pistons. Greenwood had 9 points and 9 rebounds. That's David Greenwood. Steve Johnson had 16 points and 7 boards. And Jawan Oldham had a great game, 5 points, 8 rebounds and 5 blocks. So continuing his tremendous form, particularly on the defensive end. For Detroit... Dan Ranfield and Bill Lambeer each had 21 points and 13 rebounds. Isaiah Thomas went for 19, 11 assists and 4 steals. And the aforementioned, Kelly Trapuka, had 19 points. The game breakdown the following day said that a fourth quarter melee between Juan Oldham and Bill Lambeer woke up the 13,227 fans at Chicago Stadium. The already physical game broke out into the fight with eight and a half minutes left to go in the game. Lane Beer lost his balance on a rebound attempt and grabbed Oldham by the face and jersey on his way down, only to have Juwan twist his body and slam Lane Beer to the ground. Oldham said that Lane Beer had been taunting and pulling on his jersey as they ran up court. <laughs> That's unlike Bill. And had his right fist cocked as he stood over Lambeer and was, and I quote, primed and ready to kill, end quote. <laughs> That's a little over the top from Jawan. <laughs> he was about to pick up Isaiah Thomas, who came in to break the mess up and throw him over the scorer's table before Isaiah <laughs> calmed him down. A separate wrestle on the floor also broke out between Steve Johnson and Dan Ranfield. <laughs> Older Jawanted for murder. <laughs> 
<laughs> the article said up to this point, Oldham was playing like a big man possessed, blocking three shots and recovering the third himself to take it end to end for a layup. I'm just going to interject here for a moment. I absolutely love this sort of stuff. I eat it up for breakfast. Great to read these sort of recaps and learn more about just the small little things that happen in the course of a, a game that for all intents and purposes, actually you would not have even known had happened. Crucial free throws by Jordan and Daly and a jump shot by Wes Matthews sealed the win down the stretch for Chicago. An article from the same day detailed Jonathan Culver's exit as an owner of the franchise, selling his 7% share in the team to Jerry Reinsdorf. His exit was viewed with relief by a number of people within the organization, according to the article. A source listed three examples in the last three years of negative actions by Jonathan Culver. Number one was his veto of a trade that would have sent Quinton Daly and David Greenwood to the LA Clippers in exchange for Terry Cummings. Ooh. The second was his refusal to send Reggie Theus to Houston for future bull Rodney McRae when Theus was at odds with coach Kevin Lockery. And third was the trade of Artis Gilmore to San Antonio for poor old Dave Corzin and Mark Alberding. That's great to hear that sort of stuff because it really adds a few more what ifs. Imagine if Terry Cummings yeah. actually joined the Bulls. Obviously, you give up some good scoring in Quentin Daly, but he's a bit of a loose cannon from time to time. And David Greenwood obviously was a great rebounder. But to be able to get Terry Cummings pretty much in his prime, mm, he's a Chicago boy too, Terry. Wow. And you also figure that if he hadn't been with the other team for a few years, they also wouldn't have drafted Charles Oakley in. 85, so yeah, it would have had a ripple effect, would have undoubtedly changed the entire future of the franchise. So, And there's also a mention of Rodney McRae heading to the Bulls a good seven or eight years before Jordan would actually hope to get McRae on the team as well. And he would eventually become a 1993 world champion. We love to mention that. And I think, though, if it's talking about Reggie Theus, it's obviously predating Jordan's arrival by a season or two, but still, he would have been on the roster. Jonathan Culver said he had his reasons for not going through with the trades, which he did not divulge in the article. And I quote, the body isn't even cold yet and they're already throwing stuff, said Culver. <laughs> the following days, Chicago Tribune also had an article about the accusations thrown at Culver and his bemusement that a 7% owner could be blamed for all those <laughs> decisions. That's a fair point. Hmm. On March the 12th as well, Golden State Warriors' Purvis Short dropped 40 points, yet another high-scoring performance in a single game, in a 145-122 to home win versus San Antonio Spurs. Regulation win? Yeah, regulation win. It's still startling that these sort of high-scoring numbers are just common fare back in 1985. It's great, and yet it's a time obviously long since gone, given that you're lucky to get three-figure scoring contests these days. On March the 13th, New Jersey Nets at home defeated Washington 114-109. to Michael Ray Richardson had 27 points, Otis Birdsong 24, and Buck Williams had 16 points and a season-high 22 rebounds. March the 14th, the Bulls travelled to New York at Madison Square Garden in front of 13,766 fans and lost 106-97 to against the New York Knicks. They dropped to 31-35 and on the season. Jordan entered the game nursing a sore thumb, something that would plague him for a few more games to come. And New York had lost five of their last six games before this victory over the Chicago Bulls. For Chicago, Quentin Daly had 23 points, Orlando Woolridge 22, David Greenwood had eight boards, and MJ had rather pedestrian numbers for him, 16 points, three rebounds, and eight assists. And for the Knicks, Bernard King went for 24 points, speaking of pedestrian, Daryl, the pedestrian walker, went for 22 points and 8 assists. And James Bailey had 14 points and 10 rebounds for New York. On this game, Bob Sakamoto wrote, Up and down go the Chicago Bulls. <laughs> they played like they left their hearts back in the Grand Hyatt on Thursday night. Oh, dear. After the 106-97 loss. The Knicks were severely shorthanded in this game. Among others, they were without Aaron's favourite, Pat Cummings, and starting point guard, Rory Sparrow, and even had reserve Lewis Orr playing 34 minutes on a tender ankle. I guess that was better than playing with a tender heart, wrote Bob Sakamoto. Orr was joined by James Bailey's 14 and 10 boards, 
who Sakamoto said wouldn't even make this team if everyone was healthy. Oh, dear me. Jordan, Jordan <laughs> scored only 16 points on 5 for 18 shooting and only took six shots in the second half against an aggressive Knicks trap. Another game on the same day, the LA Clippers' James Donaldson hit a short jumper with two seconds left to snap his team's 11-game losing streak in a 113-112 victory at Indiana. He also grabbed 14 rebounds in the win. On March 15th, Phoenix travelled to Chicago and the Bulls were 103-97 to winners at Chicago Stadium in front of a lowly 8,625 fans. The Bulls improved to 32-35. and Here's a random fact. Alvin Adams for the Suns. He played in one All-Star game in 1976, also the same year he won Rookie of the Year honours. For Chicago, MJ had 27 points, 9 rebounds, 14 assists, thank you very much, and 2 steals. Orlando Warriors went for 23 points. David Greenwood had 20. Dave Corzine, 16 points, 5 rebounds, and 5 blocks. Great effort. For Phoenix, the aforementioned Alvin Adams, a.k.a. Double A, had 36 points, 9 rebounds, and 6 assists. And Maurice Lucas had 19 points for the Suns. Good to see Alvin Adams absolutely lighting it up. In one of his more humorous articles, Bob Sakamoto's opening paragraph of the game breakdown versus the Suns read like this. From the zany hardwood court in Chicago Stadium, it's the Dave Corzine Letterman Show. (laughs) The article was then fashioned into a Letterman-style talk show interview about Dave Corzine's five block shots and even asked Dave for a Daryl Dawkins type name for one of his dunks, to which Corzine replied, I'll call that dunk number one with a laugh. <laughs> I'm going to cut it here. I found that paragraph to be absolutely entrancing. I loved it because I had a look over that in the research for this episode as well. And as soon as I saw Letterman in amongst the paragraph when I was just skimming it, Straight away, I went back to the start of that sentence and then read it in my mind like it was an introduction to the Dave Letterman show. The Suns came in without all-star Larry Nance and starting centre and future Chicago Bull, James Edwards. Indeed. The article spoke about the great contributions from David Greenwood, who hit his first eight shots of the game, Quinn Daly's 7-for-10 shooting and Jordan's one assist shy of a triple-double whilst going head-to-head against his idol, Walter Davis who Jordan said he was a little nervous about scoring a lot of points on him. Davis finished with 14. The article spoke about how during his three seasons at the University of North Carolina, how he was compared a lot to Walter Davis. So obviously he felt a little bit extra pressure about going up against his idol. In the locker room after the game, Dave Corzine was holding court as teammate Cowell Jones in the locker next to Dave said he was ready to sign Corzine up for the slam dunk contest (laughs) after seeing him throw one down with two sons hanging onto his waist. (laughs) I want to see that dunk. Oh, no, that'd be fantastic, wouldn't it? Talk about a couple of breakout games here from Dave. And then also in this article, getting that incredible introduction, uh, the Dave Corzine Letterman show. He's done well. There's undoubtedly a very good reason why Dave Corzine played seven seasons in Chicago. He was the uh, the whipping boy for Chicago Bulls fans during this 85 season, but to last seven full seasons with one team, he obviously did uh, a lot right, and we've seen a lot of that during this season, haven't we? He's had some really, really good games. Oh, definitely. He's had some really good games throughout that time, and we actually chatted about this, mate, with Sam Smith, who was talking about his new book recently released called There Is No Next which was on episode 7 of NB85 in allandis.com slash NB85-7. And we did ask him about Dave Corzine, and he really went into quite a bit of depth about the value of Dave and the importance to the team over that period of time. Yeah, he's been named during the games that we've watched or allegedly watched from some mystery man who may or may not have given us these games at some point in time. He's been mentioned a couple of times as one of the best jump shooting centers in the NBA. So yeah, he was um, definitely that. Now on the 15th of March, in LA's one-point home win, 115-114 to 114 over the San Antonio Spurs, the Lakers clinched their fourth straight Pacific Division title. Now we're talking mid-March here and they've already clinched the Pacific Division That shows you how great of a team they were. Worthy had 25 points and Magic dropped 21 points and 18 assists. The Spurs' George Gervin, who had 37 points of his own, missed a 25-footer at the buzzer, which would have won the game. 
it's an unconfirmed report that there was actually a 25 foot finger roll that George <laughs> tried to win the game with. Maybe the only player that would have been capable of doing such a maneuver as well and actually making it. The visiting Rockets also fell on this date, 120 to 114 at Washington. Jeff Malone scored 36 points for the Bullets. It was the fourth time in five games that he went for 30 plus points. So he was on fire too at this period of time. On March 17, in the lead-up to that night's game against the Central Division-leading Bucks, Bob Sakamoto asked, which Bulls team will show up for the St. Patrick's Day special at 2 p.m. on Sunday afternoon? The ragtag bunch of drifters that lost to New York or the more inspired group that beat the Suns on Friday? With the Bulls most likely facing the Bucks in the first round of the playoffs, Dave Corzine said, it wouldn't hurt for us to beat them on Sunday. <laughs> That's an understatement, and... Uh, a perfect example of the Jekyll and Hyde nature of this team. You've led me into that game beautifully, thank you, Aaron. Milwaukee lost the game 119-117 to in overtime at Chicago Stadium in front of 16,022 people. The Bulls improved to 33-35. and Their victory evened the season series at three apiece. It was also the 10th game in 14 days for the Bulls, and it halted Milwaukee's six-game winning streak. For Chicago, MJ had 32 points and 11 rebounds. And 16 assists. Ooh, third triple-double of the season there for MJ. Quentin Daly had 26 points and Orlando Woolridge had 21. For Milwaukee, Terry Cummings and Sidney Moncrief each went for 28 points. After trailing by as many as 22 points, the Bulls turned the game around early in the fourth quarter. In another physical game, the Bulls fired up after the ejection of Wes Matthews, who responded to a Paul McKeskey forearm shove with a punch to the pig man's body. <laughs> oh, no. Wes had to be restrained and wouldn't leave the court in protest after the ejection. The Bulls then ran off a 12-2 spurt to tie the game at 92 with 5.37 remaining. A Sydney Moncrief three with four seconds remaining sent the game into overtime. Woolridge, Daly and Jordan all hit big baskets down the stretch of regulation and the overtime period. Paul Pressey was carried off on a stretcher after a pile-up for a loose ball and an errant elbow to the eye from Steve Johnson with 56 ticks left in regulation. This was the Bulls' sixth win in nine games and was made even more impressive after trailing by 22 late in the third term. Oh, goodness. A couple of things here. Great comeback from the Bulls. Extraordinary fight back to even get back in the game after actually having a 22-point deficit. But breaking news, mate. Paul McKeskey is apparently boarding a plane as we speak <laughs> and flying to Australia. He's going to track you down. You are a goner. <laughs> dare you sledge McKeskey. You did that in the previous episode, the 69-point game, didn't you? Don't sound so surprised. It's not the first time. How often do you actually see an NBA player carried off on a stretcher? Very rarely. And he apparently ended up with two stitches just above his eye after the errant elbow. Yeah, I think earlier in this series, I actually mentioned Clyde Drexler went up for a layup at one stage and got cleaned up by somebody. Then he actually had to leave the court on a stretcher as well. So it's a rarity to say the least, but a couple of times in this particular season, we've read about that happening. But yeah, a good win, obviously, for the Bulls, of course, helping them even that season series and not too far removed from their future first-round playoff matchup, which I'm excited to chat about as well when we get to that too. Also on this same day, mate, Larry Bird had 48 points. Of course, it was St. Patrick's Day, so he probably had a bit of help from the Leprechauns, but he was also complimented by 38 points from Robert the Chief Parrish. Just think about that for a minute. Parrish had 38 points. This was the equal second-best scoring output of his career as Boston dumped the visiting Rockets 134-120. to For Houston, Ralph Sampson had 32 points. But what a performance. Bird and Parrish combining for 86 points of their own. I didn't know that Robert the Chief Parrish could have scored 38 points in an NBA game. That's a pretty impressive output from the Chief in an NBA game. <laughs> it is, it is. And uh, I also went back to the greatbasketballreference.com, had a look at his career scoring output. 40 points was his career high, so... I'd love to see the Chief go for 40 points if we could ever get access to that one, allegedly. On March 19, in the odds and ends of the Chicago Tribune, they reported that the Bulls were moving headquarters from 333 North Michigan Avenue to 425 at North Michigan Avenue, which was the property of new marketing man for the Bulls, Larry Levy. 
Also in this article, former Bulls guard Reggie Theus was quoting as calling Kansas City Kings fans screwed up <laughs> for not showing up to games in Kansas City. <laughs> calling out his own fans. Yes. Wow. Didn't see that coming. Um, also on the 19th of March, Philadelphia visited Cleveland and were playing without Moses Malone. The Cavs thumped the 76ers 116 to 89. It was the worst loss of the 85 season for Philadelphia. For the Cavs, Roy Hinson had 21 points and Ben Poquet, future Chicago Bull, had 19 points. For Philadelphia, Dr. J and Charles Barkley each had 16 and it was Cleveland's ninth win in its previous 12 games as they were really trying to fight for that last spot in the Eastern Conference playoff race. And it was this late run by the Cleveland Cavaliers that had George Carl in their discussion for Coach of the Year award in the 85 season. They had an absolute shocking start, as we've covered a couple of times earlier in this series. Cleveland were stinking it up like no other team. <laughs> a miraculous comeback to actually be in with a chance at actually making the playoffs in the last few weeks of the season. So great effort there. On the 19th of March, Chicago travelled to Houston to the summit in Texas and in front of 16,016 fans lost 106 to 100. They dropped to 33 and 36. This was Jordan's only visit to Houston as a rookie. For Chicago, it was one of 10 games they'd play on the road in the season's final 14 contests. We talk about which star would win rookie of the year. Houston coach Bill Fitch added, and this could be my favorite quote of the season thus far, even if Michael Jordan's mother had a vote, she would have to split her ballot. Quite enjoyed that one. No bias. Yeah, exactly. For Chicago, Jordan had 31 points, four rebounds, and seven assists. Quinton Daly dropped 30. Jawan Oldham had six points, eight rebounds, and six blocks. Hmm. For Houston, Ralph Sampson had 26 points and 11 rebounds, and Akeem Olajuwon went for 24 and 21 rebounds. The Bulls came back from 14 points down late in the third and had a couple of chances to tie it down the stretch. Oldham, again, had a great game with six blocks, and Lockery was very complimentary of the play of late of Quinton Daly, who had 30 points in this one. Ralph Sampson and Akeem Olajuwon combined for 50 points, 32 rebounds, and 14 dunks. <laughs> That's staggering. Yeah, great stuff. On the 20th of March, there was a wild finish in Philadelphia. Reggie Theus's short jumper was called good due to the 76ers George Johnson interfering with the net. With three seconds left, Kansas City held on for a huge 118-117 to overtime win. Eddie Johnson had 38 points for the Kings. He's a former podcast guest in allandis.com slash 41. Andrew Tony went for 38 points of his own for Philadelphia, who were hampered by continued injury problems. Same day, Marcus Johnson's season-high 32 points steered his LA Clippers to a 121-110 to home win over the visiting Utah Jazz. Something just popped up on my screen and now I can't see. Norm Nixon and Derek Smith each added 21 points for LA. And this game was most notable, however, because Mark Eaton had six blocks, giving him 396, no mistake, for the season, eclipsing the previous NBA record of 393 by Elmore Smith in 1974 for the LA Lakers. And I'll be going into Mark Eaton's shot blocking exploits a little further in this episode. Oh, I like a little teaser, mate. Good job. Speaking of Mark Eaton, here's some shameless self-promotion just for a change. Inolanus.com slash 49. A great conversation with Mark, and we particularly do talk about his 1985 season where he was the Defensive Player of the Year Award winner. One of two times he'd do that too. And Mark also enjoys your sense of humor. <laughs> yeah, he does. You have to listen to that episode to uh, fully understand that one. Also on the 20th of March... The Bulls traveled to Hemisphere Arena in Texas and took on the San Antonio Spurs. They lost 106-98 to in front of just over 10,000 fans, 10,018 to be precise, dropping their record to 33-37. and In their only other meeting of the season, November 13, at Chicago, Jordan had gone for 45 points in Chicago's 120-117 to victory, and we covered that in episode 11 of this series, mate. And I'm pretty sure that this game is available in full to view on YouTube. So if anyone ever wants to see MJ Rookie at his finest, an absolutely spectacular 45 points from MJ. Yeah, we cover that game in depth too, mate, but it is on YouTube. So check out episode 11 of this NB85 series for more on that. 
Jordan, in this game, had another great performance. He had 38 points, 7 rebounds, 4 assists and 3 steals. Orlando Woolridge had 23 points and David Greenwood pulled down 9 rebounds. For the Spurs, Mike Mitchell had 31 points and 12 rebounds. George Gervin had 19 points and Artis Gilmore went for 15 points and 8 rebounds. Bob Sakamoto said in the first half of this game, the Bulls look like bum steers at a Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> Oh. With two minutes left in the second term, Chicago <laughs> trailed by 31 points. Wow. Then they reeled off 22 unanswered points during the middle of the third term in one of the biggest swings in an NBA game that I've ever heard of. That's incredible. MJ and Orlando combined for 25 points during the third term run, and the Bulls had seven steals, led by Akeem Corzine's three <laughs> in the quarter. The Bulls... <laughs> However, you so much energy in that stretch that they couldn't withstand the comeback by the Spurs and hadn't won a game in Texas since 1982 when Rod Thorne was coaching the team. George Gervin, who scored all of his 19 points in the first half, passed Jerry West to become the ninth leading scorer in league history with 25,195 points in this game. Now, that would be a great game to get a hold of. Multiple things going on there. But to see them down by 31 points in the first half and then reeling off 22 unanswered as a team in the third. That's amazing. The final result was only eight points of difference. So remarkable goings on there. Now on March the 22nd, Larry Bird had 36 points and 15 assists, helping Boston defeat the visiting Cleveland Cavaliers 129 to 117. It was the Celtics' seventh straight victory. World B Free dropped 28 points for Cleveland. Bernard King went for 45 points as his Knicks visited Indiana, beating the Pacers 118 to 113. Now, sadly, the very next day, March the 23rd, that would be the final day of Bernard King's 1985 season. He injured his knee with one minute and 24 seconds left in the game whilst challenging a Reggie Theus shot on the fast break. King had 37 points at the time of the injury and had to be carried from the floor. He wouldn't play another NBA game until April the 10th of 1987. Putting that into perspective, that's a staggering amount of time to miss. Yeah, it's amazing. The Kings would win the game 113-105, to 105, but of course it was overshadowed by that terrible injury to Bernard. Otis Thorpe had 31 points and 18 rebounds for Kansas City. Chicago also visited Dallas on the same day at Reunion Arena in Texas in front of 17,007 fans and won the game 107-97, to improving to 34-37 and on the season. The Chicago Tribune touted this game as the, I don't know, quote, toughest ticket in town. It was sold out for more than two months. It was also Jordan's first appearance in Dallas as either a professional or amateur. For the Bulls, Steve Johnson had an absolute blinder, 31 points. It was the equal sixth highest scoring game of his career, thanks basketballreference.com. Jordan had 20 points, 9 rebounds, and 10 assists, so just missed out on a triple-double by 1 rebound. For Dallas, they were led by Mark Aguirre's 32 points. Jay Vincent had 21, and fellow 1984 draftee Sam Perkins had 14 points and 8 rebounds. Long arm Sam Perkins. <laughs> That's right. After 129 days of a countdown on a local Dallas sportscast, this was supposed to be the Michael Jordan show in Dallas. Instead, Reunion Arena got 31 points on 12 for 13 shooting by Steve Johnson. That's astonishing. When asked about his night, Johnson said it was a high degree of freakability. <laughs> That's great. What a great quote. But 12 for 13 from the field, unheard of almost, isn't it? Dallas sportscaster Dale Hansen had started a nightly countdown to MJ's early appearance of the season in Dallas. Hansen was amazed at how punctual the fans were in getting to the game early because, and I quote, nobody in Dallas shows up on time for anything, <laughs> end quote. A scalper who usually gets $100 for a game ticket when Bird or Magic are in town told Hansen that he got $225 a piece for the 28 tickets that he sold. <laughs> Promoting the work of a scalper. Dear idea. Mavs coach Dick Motta said the build-up was a nuisance to the team and he's glad they brought in, and I quote, some guy from LA, it was <laughs> Dancing Barry from LA, <laughs> to entertain the crowd because we sure didn't. Dancing Barry. Dancing <laughs> Barry. <laughs> uh, a precursor to Dancing Homo. That's terrible. Dancing Barry. Goodness me. No wonder he didn't last. <laughs> no, he probably had a 12-year career. Anyhow, uh, <laughs> Dancing Barry. 
One of the worst names for an entertainer I've ever seen. Huh. I'd prefer the chicken over that any day of the week. Speaking of the chicken, he will be getting a uh, mention very shortly. Oh, a good one. All right. Uh, on March 24th, Magic Johnson chalked up Dante Barry. Magic Johnson chalked up his 11th triple double of the season with 25 points, 10 rebounds, and 19 assists in the Lakers 148 to 130 win versus the visiting Detroit Pistons. It was the Lakers' 20th win in their last 22 games. Kareem had 30 points for the Lakers, whilst Isaiah Thomas had 30 points and 15 assists for the Pistons. Same day, Chicago travelled to Utah to the Salt Palace, and in front of 8,953 fans, they lost 110-92. to The Bulls' record decreased to 34-38. and I'm not even sure if a record can decrease, but it did. Mark Eaton entered this matchup averaging 5.7 blocks a game. Hmm. Utah scored 43 points in the last quarter. So, disgraceful effort there from the Bulls, to be honest. For Chicago, MJ had 26 points, 9 rebounds, and 6 assists. David Greenwood had 10 rebounds. For Utah, Mark Eaton had an absolute banner game. 12 points, 18 rebounds, and 8 blocks. Adrian Dantley had 29 points for the Jazz. I mentioned the San Diego chicken. I am actually mistaken. I tweeted out some images of the San Diego chicken who was on hand for the Bulls March 12 game versus the Detroit Pistons. So check that out at Bulls History on Twitter. <laughs> Speaking of shameless, shameless self promotion. Goodness me. I actually saw that photo. The chicken was behind Corwell Jones, I think, with his hands on Corwell Jones. Corwell Jones' shoulders, about to say, get into the game, young fella. <laughs> That's not true at all. I don't know what he was saying. But yeah, <laughs> move on. San Diego chicken talk? Well, if Dancing Barry can talk. Dancing Barry. San Diego chicken. <laughs> Dancing Barry. In the second game of a back-to-back, the Bulls got run out of the Salt Palace by the Jazz, who struggled in the first half and only completing nine of 19 fast-break opportunities. A 43-point last period, including a 34-8 run, blew it open for Utah. Really? A 34-8 run would blow it open? Yeah, fair, fair to say that would do it. Captain Obvious. Jordan and Daly combined for 7 for 24 shooting, and Orlando had a shocker for him, <laughs> finishing with only 10 points. Lockery attributed Utah's win to the play of Mark Eaton, who had 12 points, 18 rebounds, and 8 block shots. The players of the week for this 15-day block for the week of March 10, Daryl Griffith of the Utah Jazz averaged 32.7 points as the Jazz went 3-0. and The week of March 17, Larry Bird, in case you weren't aware of the Boston Celtics, averaged <laughs> 43.5 points per game. And yes, the exclamation mark in brackets <laughs> is justified. Adam, well done, as the Celtics went 4-0. The week of March 24, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar of Los Angeles averaged 28.7 points per game on a disgraceful 75.5% field goal <laughs> percentage on the week as the Lakers went 3-0. and The individual highs for this period of time, mate. Larry Bird went for 60 points, as we mentioned, against the Atlanta Hawks on the 12th of March. Buck Williams had 22 rebounds for the New Jersey Nets against the Washington Bullets on the 13th of March. And Norm Nixon of the LA Clippers had 21 assists in a game against the Detroit Pistons on the 18th of March. Just quickly, we'll round out with the NBA standings through March 24. The division leaders in the Atlantic, it was the Boston Celtics with 57 and 14. They had seven consecutive wins. The Central Division was led by the Milwaukee Bucks with 50 and 21. In the Midwest, the Nuggets were 45 and 26. And in the Pacific, the newly crowned Pacific Division champions, the LA Lakers, were 52-18 and 18 on the back of seven consecutive wins as well. For Chicago, 34-38. and 38. They went 4-5 and five in these nine games we've covered today. Meanwhile, the Pacers went 1-7 and seven and had lost 12 of their last 13, dating back to the 2nd of March, and along with the Golden State Warriors, were equal cellar dwellers of the NBA at 20-51. and 51. All right, mate, that wraps up yet another installment of NBA 85. Anything you'd like to add, mate, before we put a bow on this bad boy? Just a note to Paul McKeskey. My address will be in the show notes. Giddy up. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show and share my web address with your friends and colleagues in allairness.com. Check out the podcast archive for plenty more episodes with high-profile guests. Follow me on Twitter at inallairness. Please add your like to the show's social hub, facebook.com slash inallairness. Join me next time for another edition of the show.